Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. And today we are also going to be interviewing the fantastic Paul Puy. And um, Paul, before I ask how you're doing, uh, I will introduce you to our audience. So uh, Paul is the CEO and co-founder of Edge Wallet, uh, a Bitcoiner and hobby rock climber uh, from the Philippines and raised in the US. Uh, I think all of that is correct, but you can always tell me if I'm wrong. How are you doing? How are you doing today? Uh, doing well. You knocked it out of the park. Yeah, most people don't know that I was originally born in the Philippines, definitely raised in the U.S. most of my life. Can barely speak a lick of Tagalog, which is the main language out of the Philippines, but uh, definitely part of my heritage and enjoyed my life here almost primarily in California the whole time. Nice. Cali, Cali guy. Okay, that's cool. But it's, uh, yeah, definitely. It's good to be proud of the heritage. So yeah, it's, uh, that's what I found uh, about you online anyway. And I'd, I've watched some interviews and all sorts uh, and uh, checked out Twitter and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, well, yeah, I suppose I, I have a number of questions. I think, I think uh, myself and Carla and, and Jerry do, but um, one of them, um, I kind of is what you, based on what you just said, actually. So obviously, as you said, you're raised in California um and growing up in the u.s uh, and you were involved in like the tech industry i i suppose from from fairly early on and because you worked at nvidia for early example age. yeah I worked in uh, videos coding at like fifth sixth grade writing some simple programs and whatnot in in the i guess you can call it open source era era back in the days we call it shareware shareware um, but yeah definitely been in technology most of my life i did take a break for a little bit but uh i just happened to be in california that's where my parents landed when uh they, they migrated over and happened to be in the epicenter of technology in you know, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. Um, maybe that had an influence in it, but I think it's just kind of almost part of my soul and psyche to be a part of technology. It's like some happy coincidences that just kind of go with who you yeah. are, I suppose. Um, so I suppose like that is obviously definitely, uh, it's kind of something in, in line a little bit with Bitcoin, because obviously it's technology, right? But like, what's your, I guess, what's your Bitcoin story um, with all of that? Like, how did you find it and kind of what, was interesting about it to you, I suppose, because everyone seems to have something different that kind of hooks them to it um, and makes them decide to, to move into this as like a sort of uh, hobby. Yeah, I think, uh, I think if you look at Bitcoin and some of the main things that interest people about Bitcoin, um, ironically, I think almost all aspects of it were, were compelling to me. So from the viewpoint of the technology, a lot of people get into just pure technology. Like they don't care about like financial freedom. They don't care about, you know, monetary policy and whatnot. They're just like, wow, this technology is really fascinating. You know, it's solving a hard computer science problem. Um, and given that I, like I mentioned, grew up in the Bay Area, you know, worked in Silicon Valley, used to work for NVIDIA. Uh, the technology was fascinating to me, right? It's, you know, I was, mm. I've been for the most of my life uh, a software engineer. And I love that, you know, hard problem, a hard problem was being solved with Bitcoin. You know, I worked at NVIDIA and I felt like, there's a, few, there's a few different disciplines of computer science uh, that draw a lot of the sh sharp, smart people in solving hard problems. And I felt like computer graphics is one of those. Um, I felt like I was surrounded by having worked in that industry, a lot of the really sharp people that know very complex math that actually put stuff on your screen. And growing up to me, that was magic, right? It, it, as they say, any, any sufficiently complex technology can be seen to someone else as just magic. And that's what it was to me. And so to kind of unravel that magic and see what's inside of the top hat of a magician was fascinating to me. And I love being surrounded by those people. And in the same sense, Bitcoin, um, I feel in similar sense, being surrounded by a lot of the sharp, smart people that are solving hard problems of distributed computing and cryptography. So that part definitely appealed to me um, from the viewpoint of kind of a different mechanism by which we can uh, send value. That part appealed to me actually from the period in time when I stopped working in technology. So from about 2005 or so, give me one second, I've got a call coming in here on Signal, which oh, great privacy app, which I'm also a big fan of. But um, uh, from about 2004 to 2000, I pretty right into the, when I got into crypto in 2013, that entire time I'd worked actually in small business. Um, didn't really do much in technology other than, you know, the kind of things that every small business needs. You know, you need accounting, you need some software, IT and whatnot. But for the most part, didn't really touch technology. But I, having worked in small business, I realized the value of having access to proper payment mechanisms, particularly more, more irreversible. I witnessed having worked at a bar or restaurant, counterfeit money coming across the table. 
having to deal with counting wet and dirty bills um, after a nightclub event, having to haul tens of thousands of dollars from a small business to a bank in a backpack, hoping I don't get jumped. And then as well, of course, the thing that everyone talks about dealing with chargebacks of credit cards. If you think credit card fees are high at three to 5%, if you actually tack on the chargebacks that you're very likely to get, especially in an environment like a nightclub and restaurant where it's dark, you don't really know if the ID matches and whatnot, and most don't even check an ID. If you add that, then you're looking at more like six, 7% all in all. Like you don't know when you're going to get a chargeback. If you take it on a year basis, you're actually adding another percent or two. So that piece really appealed to me. Like the fact that we have a different payment system, one that doesn't have the same issues that we have with traditional kind of credit card based payments, debt based payments. Um, that appealed to me as well, like basically the, the, the payment system. And then a third part that appealed to me was a little bit more indirect. And this is where I, this is from when I had worked in kind of the health and wellness space. I had actually worked in a gym. I was uh, uh, an instructor for, for climbing adults and kids and whatnot. And you start surrounding yourself with that kind of, with those type of people. You start learning different ways to take care of yourself um, from a health point of view, what you should eat, what you should do. And I was surrounded by great, you know, healthy, well-standing people. And I realized that a lot of what our world tells us as truth, as far as everything from medicine to nutrition and whatnot, a lot of it is, I'm not going to call it like a blatant lie, but so, so divergent from what I found actually works. And that a lot of our system is really rooted in, well, what financially works for the big companies? What do the incumbents want to, what, what kind of narrative do the incumbents want to drive their bottom line? Um, I'd read an interesting book. I don't know if any of you have read uh, Born to Run, right? That was one of the books that really initiated some of my thoughts. Um, and Born to Run was uh, a book that tell, told a true story of a tribe. And I think it was Mexico or South America that was, you know, from almost birth till 60, 70 year old, they just ran all the time. They would run hundreds of miles sometimes in a day um, just because I was just part of their, their psyche. Um, and they ran most of the time nearly barefoot. So you know, there's the whole, um, you, you've heard of, I'm sure of the, the trend of barefoot running and what yeah, it yeah. does for you. It's very dif difficult for most people because we're just not accustomed to it. And in that story, they had told how shoe companies obviously don't want that trend actually moving forward. They don't want people adopting that trend because they can't sell shoes. You know, these, these tribal Indians were basically running in leather sheets, sheets of leather, and that's it. There was almost nothing there on your foot. So how is Nike supposed to sell this huge air sole cushion shoe for $150 when people found that it actually is healthier for you and more performant for you to run nearly barefoot once you strengthen your feet to become mm -hmm. strong enough to do so. So that's only one nugget example, but it really opened my eyes and started having me ask the question, what's the, the, the motivation underneath a lot of these companies? What do they want to do? And if you think about it, government to me is no different than a company. It's just a really, 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 really big one. It's, it's the biggest company in any geographical, geographic jurisdiction. And so discovering Bitcoin in 2013, after having a lot of those opinions about large establishment really, really changing the narrative, also aligned for me to say, oh my gosh, this is a way of taking a lot of power from the largest companies in the world, which are the governments. And when they don't have that financial power, they have a significantly lessened ability to drive the narrative. Now the narrative can really come out from the individual. So I like to say that Bitcoin flattens the, flattens the pyramid. There will always be a pyramid. Like people, don't think, people have this dream it'll be totally flat, fully decentralized, everyone peer to peer, never gonna happen. Humans and animals actually crave hierarchy. But that hierarchy at a certain point becomes dangerous and it becomes corrupting. So the goal is to kind of flatten that hierarchy, flatten the dis distribution of wealth, flatten the power and start to surface some of the truths that some of the, the, the smaller players in our world have and lessen the narrative that come from the really you know, largest companies at the very top, which for the most part are governments. So yes, all aspects of of cryptocurrency, almost all aspects of crypt cryptocurrency, Bitcoin have really, really resonated with me um, in different angles. So there's your, oh gosh, five, 10 minute answer to your first, first, first one question. No, I appreciate it. That's a really good answer. And it shows like how, and it kind of, I guess it already answers a question I had in my mind a little bit in that, like I was gonna say, well, how did you find yourself going professionally into this? But I feel like I kind of already know the answer and that, well, hey, this thing's resonated so, 
strongly. It's not just hit one point. There's three big points that have like hit you um, pretty yeah. hard there. And sorry for saying you're a hobby rock climber because you you instructed. So it's just beyond the hobby. So I'll take that's that what I said at the beginning. <laughs> it's a hobby now for sure. So I guess you were accurate in saying that Paul is a hobby rock climber right now. So I barely call myself a professional. I was never, I never got paid to climb. Um, but I got paid to work in a climbing gym and instruct a few people and, you know, take a few people out, out into the, the rocks. Um, it never was something that I would call myself elite, but I had a great time doing it. And uh, I was definitely much better shape than I am now. <laughs> no, it's a pretty cool thing to, to be involved in. But yeah, so I, I think that kind of answers what I was going to ask. Uh, Paul, I kind of wanted to switch gears. Um, yeah. You mentioned your work with NVIDIA. And yeah. I was really curious about your opinion on the overlap between gaming and crypto and where you see it going. Um, some people talk about NFTs. We have Satoshi games where you can play for yeah, sats yeah. over lightning. Which direction do you kind of see it going? I think the two industries kind of have overlap almost everywhere. So almost all facets of life seek and crave entertainment and gaming is a key piece of that. So we see gaming kind of, um, bleeding into so many different industries from like the generic entertainment industry, the obviously hardcore, like actually PC gamers down to on mobile, my wife, you know, hop in bed and what does she do? She's playing a game right before going to bed on her phone. And so I think gaming really bleeds into a, a vast majority of society. Money on the other hand is obviously everywhere. Like you pretty much can't go to any, um, any jurisdiction and survive without some aspect of money. I mean, barter is pretty much gone by the wayside. Like no one is using barter anymore. So therefore money is a key piece of that. Um, the blend of the two is rel relatively inevitable. We've seen value in games for decades, right? What, what people deem as points really is a currency. It's just a matter of what can you trade those points for. In the early days, points, well, you couldn't trade for anything. You, you could trade them for bragging rights. You go to the 1980s arcade and you're playing Asteroids or Pac-Man and you get a score. Well, you can't really do much with that score other than, hey, that was me. Uh, those are my three digits up there in, on, on the Pac-Man scoreboard. And there wasn't much after that. Then, of course, we came into kind of the, the more um, like adventure games, uh, longstanding games. I, I was a big fan of like the Ultima series uh, back in the 90s and whatnot, 80s and 90s. Um, and there, the points now amounted to something tradable within the game. It wasn't massively online. It was not an online game, but you still felt the, the desire to accumulate some kind of wealth in different forms, swords, gold, points, health, mana, in, in, what, in whatever sense. Um, and I think ever since that era of gaming, when we kind of moved past just arcades and a, and a scoreboard, and you started getting into more adventure-based gaming, larger games with a storyline, it was there, there almost didn't exist a single game that didn't have some form of currency inside of it. And really the blend of, of uh, cryptocurrency and the gaming is an attempt at bridging multiple games. That's really it. I think personally, I think there's a lot of poor use cases of cryptocurrency. I'm one of the people like, oh, that's, that's a shitty project. That's a shitty project. That's a shitty project. I'm like one of the first to call out some really poor use cases. Um, but the primary value, if you were to put a cryptocurrency in a single game, there's not really much, much use case for that. Um, at that point, it might as well just be, you know, points in the system that you can redeem. It's when you need to cross over between various different games. Like how do, how do different companies, um, different publishers publishing different games agree to who's going to hold the database of points that goes from one game to another, right? Who's going to control that? Um, the one way to do it is effectively cryptocurrency because that is kind of the one um, you know, neutral ledger that can hold that value and hold who and control who holds that value across different games. Much like the value of cryptocurrency outside of games is when you're having to do things such as crossing borders, right? Making payments across borders is highly friction because the countries can't agree who's gonna hold the ledger. Um, within a country, it's a lot easier. Within a single bank, it's even the easiest. And cryptocurrency really can't compete when you're paying someone from the same bank account, like Chase the Chase. You've already been KYC'd and they know who you are. Uh, I could pay someone pretty easily. And that's where I think gaming and cryptocurrency really start to take hold. There are some, there are some challenges there. You know, there's some regulation that really doesn't want that to happen. Um, but barring regulation, that's where I think there's a huge benefit in being able to transfer your value between games and even between publishers that may not necessarily agree, agree with each other. I say one of the things that I think of when I, uh, when it comes to gaming is like, um, 
hey, that there, there, there could be like a big incentive for publishers or game gaming companies um, to not want you to be able to, you know, take value absolutely. from one place to another, right? Like, uh, well, that's absolutely. So that's one of the challenges as well. A lot of games, if you think about game publishers, they're, they're kind of playing God, right? They, they want to say, hey, here's how many gold chests we're putting in the game. Here's how many swords we're putting in the game. Here's how, much, how many actual, you know, pieces of gold you want to put in the game and they want to be able to have those dials much like the federal reserve except that unlike the federal reserve the goal isn't okay let's stimulate the economy let's make sure the economy is healthy and people are coming into they're paying their taxes people want to migrate into the country there's a high demand for our country the dials and goal is let's make people have fun right let's make sure it's enjoyable and when it's enjoyable more people buy the game and have fun and more people buy the game and have fun so those are the dials that they that they want to be able to control. And as soon as you introduce cryptocurrency into it, if it's a real cryptocurrency and not you know, this kind of fake thing that's centrally controlled, or might as well not be crypto, then you do remove one of the dials, right? So you're removing a dial that, some, that the game developer no longer has control over. And that could be, you know, I won't call it catastrophic, but that is a negative for sure. So now comes the challenge and the balance is, can you remove one dial for the game developer, still allow them to have enough control to enjoy the game but now add an additional element of, of entertainment in being able to transfer value and wanting to go from game to game to game to game. So historically speaking, just like in the real financial system, usually the incumbents don't want that to happen, right? The US, the UK, um, Australia, Canada, they're not really positive on, on Bitcoin cryptocurrency. Very true. Right? Because they are the incumbents. They don't want easy value transfer out of their country. Same thing with probably the biggest game developers. They're not going to be too receptive of introducing crypto into the games. However, this is where you have the opportunity to flatten the pyramid. So some of the smaller game developers that you know want a leg up, i.e. the smaller countries, El Salvador, which has been obviously you know the biggest name in the news, they want a leg up. They're the ones that are going to be adopting a technology that does allow faster streamlined more communication across different countries or across different games. So you're totally right, Lawrence, is that uh, a lot of games won't want to give up that control. By and large, those are going to be some of the bigger behemoths, but this is now an opportunity for some of the smaller, uh, smaller players in, this, in the space to kind of level up. Same analogy happened with the internet. The biggest players, the Barnes and Nobles, you know, that you know, try to fight the internet because they wanted people to buy physical books. Those are the ones that are at risk. The smaller players or the players that didn't even exist, they came out of nowhere to incorporate the internet are the ones that now have a competitive advantage in a more open network. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a good point. So that's basically, it's like um, putting the, the game companies like countries is a fairly like good way of thinking as well, actually. It's, uh, yeah, definitely interesting. Um, I always find it hard with game companies, uh, like uh, producers, whatever, games, because it's like, you know, these are the things that can make your childhood and you have these great memories. And then you see what they actually do when the business kind of comes and it's just like, oh, things like EA and Bethesda and you're like, oh. But, um, yeah. but no, it's definitely interesting. And I guess you mentioned um, El Salvador. Um, and yeah, as you said, it's it's kind of all over the Bitcoin news world at the moment um, yep. and rightfully so. Um, but it's to the point where I'll talk to you know friends of mine who aren't interested in crypto and I'm like, oh yeah, of course, you know, with El Salvador and they, they're like, they haven't heard about it at all. And I'm thinking, oh, like how at this point? But um, it's, it's everything we hear about. But um I suppose what were your because you were in Miami, right? Um, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what were your thoughts um, when this was announced? Like, were you there at, at the announcement, or, or I guess did you hear about the buzz? Like, what was it like when it? Because I wasn't there, obviously. And so. I heard, I heard it from somebody else before the announcement. Someone who had actually bumped into, um, I think Michael. I can't remember his last name, but Michael something something who the native of San Diego actually, who was part of the kind of spark in getting El Salvador to kind of accept Bitcoin as kind of native currency. Um, he was the one that I believe had taken the, the anonymous donation and pushed it out across the small little beach town, right? The, uh, the big, the, the blockchain beach or Bitcoin beach, Bitcoin town, beach, yeah. <clears throat> Bitcoin beach town that, uh, that now is like everywhere you go, you can spend Bitcoin. So I had heard about it indirectly from a friend who originally was from San Diego and he had talked to Michael about it before the announcement. Um, and my thought was, both a wow, right? But B, um, uh, it actually brought back a conversation I had the night before with one of my co coworkers about you know the gradual adoption of Bitcoin versus a sudden adoption of Bitcoin. 
So the gradual adoption of Bitcoin is what we've been seeing for the past, obviously, 10 years. And no major jurisdiction has really massively adopted it as a really core part of the economy. Right? It's always been just kind of speculative. Let me trade it. It's an, it's an investment as opposed to part of a true economy. Um, and we've, we, we posited that that's kind of healthy in the sense that as the, uh, as the asset becomes stable over time, because more people acquire it, it becomes much more usable as a currency. Like stability does present some good advantages uh, for usage as a currency. And we said, well, what were to happen if a, if a demographic of people, a geographic uh, of people suddenly said, boom, this is our, our payment method. This is our currency and we'll use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, great if it's stable, great if it's uptrending, but pretty rough if it's volatile. And since some of the countries that I think would be most interested in, in Bitcoin are the ones that don't really have a lot of income in the first place, like they're not the most wealthy countries, i.e. El Salvador, they're countries that likely would be very impacted, the, the, the citizens would be likely very impacted in a really volatile market. And so it did open up that question to us like, oh, wow. So if people really are actively transacting in Bitcoin, how are they handling the volatility? Really is the question that came up. To me, I'm not, and actually, I didn't see the presentation, so that wasn't brought up, um, at least not to my knowledge, uh, as far as how do you handle a small, um, you know, not necessarily wealthy, not very wealthy demographic that have to handle the volatility of the currency that they're using to transact, especially if it's the primary one that they end up transacting long term. That's the open question that I think is, is tough to answer. And I think I think that's because I was thinking of the different challenges that um, El Salvador will face, and obviously that is, as you say, probably one of the biggest challenges. And I know one of their solutions, uh, which kind of cheapens the Bitcoin dream that you know a lot a lot of people, including myself, kind of hope for, is 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 allowing, um, say, for example, a small shop owner is accepting Bitcoin, is allowing them to to pretty quickly turn that into dollars. Like, um, so the right. government's obviously got that fund, which it's kind of it's only fair to be honest like you can't just yeah you know, in my opinion you can't just expect a whole country as as you said for the people who that might not necessarily be able to even handle that level of volatility um because they may not have enough money to support their shop and family etc to expect them to just suddenly you know start expect accepting this this currency is just is pretty mm -hmm. difficult so i think it's the right thing to do to have this fund to begin with and and kind of help people ease into it um, so that's one way is like instantly having it turn into dollars so they don't have to deal with that that volatility issue as much. But then even then it's like, I suppose they'd be pricing in, in dollars and then obviously they're accepting the Bitcoin and it's going straight into dollars. So it doesn't cause an issue for pricing right. either. So I suppose that's part of the way they're dealing with it, but it's not really the Bitcoin way of dealing with it, is it really? Yeah. I mean, there's some value to accepting, you know, accepting payment with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, you know, because as we know, cryptocurrencies, they're the first, I mean, Bitcoin being the first one, Bitcoin was the first um, asset that had a built-in payment network, right? So to me, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is defined by both the asset, the 21 million cap, hard money, as well as the fact that it has a built-in way of sending and receiving. That's never existed before. There's no money ever on earth that ever came with its own payment network. Um, probably the closest is anything physical. And that, and that payment network was literally your hands transferring it in midair. That was the payment yeah. network was the physical air between you know two people exchanging hands but anything else never came with the payment network you put it you put a payment network on top of it you know you put visa on top of the dollar you put venmo on top of as well the dollar you know, there's always a layer on top of it where where bitcoin had its own payment network um and so yeah there's an advantage of using the payment network you know uh, if you accept it you can accept payments from anyone in the world regardless of whether or not they have access to visa mastercard um, but to, from the viewpoint of helping stabilize the currency, I think that using it as purely a payment network and nothing else doesn't help stabilize it. Um, one of the things that I'm looking for in, uh, in helping stabilize Bitcoin is actually using it as um, a medium, not just a medium of exchange, but a unit of account. Mm. That to me is the big, the big transition where I say, you know, I will do this work for you for 0 0.01 Bitcoin, right? Not a dollar amount, a Bitcoin amount. And I think we've, you kind of see that on a very short time horizon when you make a payment. You know, you, for example, BitPay will lock the exchange rate for 15 minutes. So you basically you're creating a 15 minute contract denoted in Bitcoin. The dollar is, is insanely stable because there are multiple countries that have decade long contracts specifically for oil denoted in dollars. They say, we'll pay you this amount of dollars per year 
for X amount of you know, uh, barrels of oil over the next 20 to 30 years. Now, once you do that, you've now motivated two parties to stabilize the dollar. You know, one side make, wants to make sure it earns enough dollars to pay for that oil. And another side wants to make sure that, that it can pay other things with those dollars. Right? So it ends up being uh, the unit of exchange. And I think people um, disregard the value of being a unit of exchange in creating stability. Um, case in point example, uh, we had a contract developer working for Edge and uh, we agreed to actually pay that developer, not just pay in Bitcoin, but actually quote each task in Bitcoin. So he would say, okay, I'll finish this. You know, I think it'll take me about a month and I'll be, I mean, like I said, like 0.01 Bitcoin or 0.1 Bitcoin. And uh, we're then motivated for that you know, one month to make sure we have enough Bitcoin to pay that person. So by us having to hodl that much Bitcoin, we've added a little bit of stability to the ecosystem. And if you start taking those contracts and making them longer and longer, 15 minutes being the starting point with a bit pay invoice, hardly any effect, a month starting to have actually a longer effect, now take that to a year or two years or four years. Once companies start to really, or even individuals start making longer term contracts in Bitcoin, I fundamentally believe that that's going to help stabilize the price because now you have parties that really, really want to keep that stable from their point of view, right? One wants it to go up, but not down. One wants it to go down, you know, and not up. Well, the two kind of counterbalance each other. Yeah, it's a really good point you make. And it's like something that, um, so with one of the, uh, the companies that I've uh, been a part of starting up, we tried to do our accounting um, and we did do our accounting in the early days for the first about eight months in Bitcoin, <laughs> um, which was pretty tough, but um, it tough. was actually really, it was the best thing for us because we had people investing from Brazil, New Zealand and the UK in our respective currencies. So it was actually easier to just say, that Bitcoin is is just yeah it's it's a global currency right so it made that actually very simple. Having said that, obviously you know there was other challenges with that, but um, and oh, we've yeah. now had to switch to, to the local currency um, for the sake of government. But yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, El Salvador, like the Philippines, is a huge remittance market for the U.S. As a Filipino American, have you ever sent money to your family like in the Philippines with Bitcoin, or is it easier to do with Western Union? I have, I have with Bitcoin, but more of just like, hey, here's some Bitcoin so you can see that I actually can send you money overseas with very, at the time, very low fees. So this is, I haven't done that since fees spiked in 2017. So that I haven't done. Um, ironically, it actually is less efficient if you want the native fiat currency. If you have a native fiat currency and you want a native fiat currency, it can be incredibly less efficient. The, there is a bank in the Philippines that has a presence in the U.S., if you have a bank account there or know someone with a bank account there, and, and fortunate for at least me and my family, um, we usually know a relative that has a bank account with that specific company. And then you just deposit in the US and that shows up kind of almost instantly over there in the Philippines. So it, it's one of these cases where crossing borders can be fast if you have a centralized entity. So centralization is very efficient. You know, so people really knock that word. It's become like a four letter word in crypto. Oh, centralized, oh, centralized. Um, a, it isn't even well-defined. Like I hate using the word decentralized even. Uh, you'll hear me say this in, in a few talks. I hate the word decentralized. I hate the word centralized because no one agrees as to when you've achieved it, right? All the Bitcoiners and Maxis will go, oh, but Ethereum's you know, centralized. Well, okay, well define that. You know? and, and what does it have to do to become decentralized? And how, how, um, how do you define Bitcoin as decentralized? At, at what point has it become decentralized? It clearly wasn't when Satoshi was the only one running nodes. When did it become that? And no one really defines a threshold. So anyway, so it's, as an aside, I kind of hate using um, those words. But yeah, centralization can be very, very efficient, right? It can be very corrupt, but efficient. And so uh, if you are fortunate enough to be some of the, you know, fortunate part of the population that has access to some of these centralized services, and you're doing a transaction that they approve and, you know, are not going to censor, then it's very fast and efficient. And I'm, I was fortunate my family does have access to that. It's when you're in, say, remote regions of the Philippines or El Salvador, you don't have access to a bank. You're primarily cash-based, um, uh, barely have, there, there's no branch for you to walk into. Then this is where Bitcoin shines. As long as you've got an internet connection, you can, you can transfer value. Converting that into your native currency might be another, another issue altogether, though. But I'm assuming in El Salvador, there's a lot of people there that have Bitcoin, that want Bitcoin, you'll probably be able to convert it on the streets pretty easily. 
I should say, well, if you're in, if you're in the Philippines, there's tons of bit refill gift cards you can get, so uh, you can right. always transfer. Right. <laughs> I had to do the plug; it was too good not to do it. Um, where you nope, can get, sure. you know, <laughs> you get tons of. We got a lot of people in the cards. Philippines who love our giveaways. Whenever we do a part, we do we've done a handful of uh, uh, promotions with bit refill, saying, "Hey, we'll give you know free pizza cards, blah blah blah." Definitely, quite a few people uh, based out of the Philippines respond on Twitter with interest in some of those promotions because you're exactly right; you can definitely convert those over to cards. In a way, it's kind of a remittance rail. Right, send someone Bitcoin, they convert it into various cards that they can actually use for their day to day life. Yeah, it's true. And we have got Jolly Bee and all sorts. It's always it's quite funny. I always like seeing oh, yeah. uh, the different stuff in other countries. But uh, yeah, well, I, I suppose to take it away from my uh, my shameless plug there, I um, you mentioned uh, Edge uh, Wallet, which obviously is you know uh, a big part of what you've worked on. Um, and last week we spoke with uh, Adam Fixer of Wasabi Wallet and their privacy focused goals and, and the way yeah, that that yeah. wallet was built. Um, and obviously with Edge Wallet, uh, it's a lot of the, the message and your goal um, from my perspective and what I've seen is about securing your customers' freedoms um, to a degree, like keeping things secure, private, like data secure and private. Um, so what is it for you that led to this focus of privacy and security? Um, was it more something that was like aligned with your core beliefs and kind of went along with what you saw in Bitcoin, as you explained before, or was it something that more came about from the perspective of, Hey, you know, we need to build what the people want. And like, you know, there's not enough, uh, while it's doing this, let's, let's, you know, let's care about people's privacy and let's shine upon that and make that our USP. Yeah. So, uh, almost all of my life, I've been a bit more of a private person. Like, yes, I show up on podcasts, I give talks and whatnot, but um, other than Twitter, I'm really on social media. Um, and, and Twitter is, is less of what I consider to be kind of a, a, a privacy exposing social media platform. At least I don't view it as one. I, I think of it as more of sharing thoughts, right? Sharing thoughts that you want to get out there. And that's how I use it. I don't use it to just kind of take selfies and show where I am um, or uh, show pictures of my kids and blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it's a sharing of thought. Um, Facebook, I, I don't even have installed on my phone, right? I, I'll, I'll go there to message people because they're messaging me. Um, and so that's, I think it's just a bit more, a, a bit more a part of my core psyche is that I really like having that choice of, hey, here's what I want public and here's what I want private. I don't think everything in the world can be private. I don't think you can use um, all privacy-based tools for everything we do. And someone, people said, oh, I want like the, the new blockchain-based Facebook, but you know, I own my data and it's totally private. I go, will not ever happen personally. I don't think that will ever happen, right? Those are platforms for sharing things and for getting information and photos and videos or whatever out to the public. So don't ever expect that whatever you put on there is gonna be private in any way, shape or form, right? Sure, maybe an individual that's three degrees disconnected from you and your friends might not be able to see it, but that data is out on the dark web. Like everything I put on Facebook, I assume is out on the dark web and in the government's hands and whatnot. Um, so those will continue to be that way. But I want to be able to have my, my financial information private, right? I, I don't want to be using cloud-based tools that effectively expose all of my financial information to whoever, who doesn't need to see it. So obviously my bank will see all of it. I can't stop them from doing that. But why share it with like Intuit, with like online financial applications, you know, Quicken Online and whatnot. So it's just a bit of more of my core psyche. Now to get, you know, not to kind of throw anyone under the bus, but kind of some of our, our differences in opinion between a product like Edge and uh, a Wasabi Wallet is that you know there's incredible high levels of privacy and different angles of what you think are the privacy attack vectors, and you could try to build product that attacks you know one one uh, or it solves one privacy attack vector versus another versus another and you know and whatnot. And our angle is we want to attack the vectors that we can solve with no user experience compromise. That's the fundamental thing. I don't want a user jumping through hoops to gain additional layers of privacy. I want it where someone who gives, gives no, no question at all, like they give no damn about, at all about privacy. They're using Venmo and screaming at the top of their lungs from you know, top of volcano. I just paid Bob you know, 20 bucks for a foot massage. Like <laughs> Those people should be able to use privacy preserving tools and not even know that these are better tools. And so case in point example, like Signal really, really blue chunks many years ago. I tried using it, it totally sucked. So I fell back to standard old fashioned SMS and you know Google chat and blah, 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 all the, all the junk, um, which isn't private at all. Um, as soon as Signal improved and it drastically improved over the past two to three years, it's kind of become my de facto go-to. 
And when people ask, how can I get, how can they get in touch with me? That's my first choice. And it doesn't feel like a privacy-based app. You don't really have to know that it's privacy-based. It, it works pretty seamlessly. And the same thing to me applies to cryptocurrency. I, I both value the applications and the protocols that take privacy by default and hide any of the complexity of privacy. You just use the asset. Like we were one of the first, um, we were actually the first multi-asset app to incorporate uh, Monero. And that I really love because it was the user experience just feels like you're sending and receiving a crypto. There's no, oh, I'm going to go mix my funds now. I'm going to switch manually switch addresses. I'm going to give one address to this person, one address to that person, um, have different wallets so that I segregate funds. And I'm going to pick my UTXOs intelligently. Ugh, like seriously, is that what someone should have to go through for privacy? Um, and not to slam the, you know, the, the Bitcoin maxis out there. I know Sergey kind of is one. So apologize, Sergey. But I think <laughs> this is kind of like the root issue I have with a lot of the culture in Bitcoin is it's not rooted in user experience, right? It's not, it, it's like, let's take the absolute um, maximum of this, this, and that, even if it compromises user experience. And, and that's where I, I think we differentiate. If we can't deliver it with a good user experience, then, uh, then we're not, we're not going to do it. And not that we're great at user experience. There's always things we can improve on for sure. Uh, but some of those initiatives with privacy, security, we want to deliver with a, a very familiar, you know, user experience what people are used to, and not drive them down some very bizarre path that makes them just go, ah, I'm just going to go use the very unprivate stuff like a Coinbase, which mm -hmm. admittedly is something that I've said with respect to messaging, like, oh, Signal sucked like six years ago. So what did I do? I used the shitty stuff because that's where everyone else is going to be. Same thing with crypto. Like if, if the private stuff are shitty to use, no one's going to use it and it'll just get driven towards the, the, the public transparent things. That's definitely correct. I mean, I suppose it's also when you're, when you're a beginner in crypto as well, there's a lot of information being thrown at you. Um, huh. And if you're also, if you're a beginner, it's, it's terrifying. Like I remember when I first got into crypto and sending yeah. my first transaction, it's like, oh my God, I'm sending my money to this string of, I, 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 who knows, you know, I'm, and it goes. And then because with this, where's Bitcoin, it's, you know, it takes 10 minutes. So I'm sitting there thinking, Oh, God. You know, I, I didn't I didn't really understand the blockchain at that point either. So it was like, is it going to come? Is it going to turn up? I don't know. Yeah. So I, I guess, it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, so you want to, you definitely find yourself relying on things that look very clean, clear, simple, very modern. Familiar, yeah. Because you're otherwise terrified. <laughs> so. Uh, no, absolutely. So like, you know, getting a user flow and, and the thing is user experience is super, super subjective. Right, it depends who you ask, what their experience level is, what have they done in, the, in their past life, and whatnot. It's very subjective, but the the one anchor that we try to utilize in in defining uh, a familiar or good user experience is, is familiarity. What are people used to doing with a financial application? Great, let's try as best as possible to mirror that experience. Right, everyone calls, everyone says like, "Hey, when's the when's the Venmo experience of crypto going to happen?" And it, it's going to be hard for us to be exactly Venmo. Because, you know, it's one centralized entity and you can't Venmo from, you can't use your Venmo app to send someone money um, on Zelle. That's incompatible. So once you have these kind of agreed upon standards, there's always a little bit of a compromise than someone just vertically integrating being fully centralized. Um, and that's the challenge, but let's at least get as close as we can um, and see where we can have a, a good balance of the ideology in the technology, such as privacy, security, autonomy, those are the three kind of tenets that we try to stand by. A balance of that, but then user experience, so people who don't care about those three things still get it. Something you mentioned as well is that um, the uh, Edge is, is, uh, supports mul multiple different types of uh, cryptocurrencies and tokens. Um, was that something that you guys wanted to do from the beginning or is that something that kind of appeared uh, after a while because of user demand or the setting a challenge or, or, or I guess, as you say, trying to kind of create like a Venmo experience of, okay, well, someone wants to use this token. We accept it. We accept that one. We accept that the best stuff. What was it that kind no, of drove actually, that? I mean, when we founded it, we were really hoping Bitcoin would be it. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I won't call it a Bitcoin maximalist, but I was, I always felt like, Oh, Bitcoin can achieve just about, any of the things that other cryptocurrencies would propose. I always saw other, other coins as the test bed. Like, hey, let's see if it works and see if there's demand for it. And if there is, and it saw enough interest, then it could be incorporated into Bitcoin, whether it be you know, block size changes, programmability, um, speed of transactions and, and whatnot. And it is much simpler to achieve a Venmo experience with just one coin. Like there is no Venmo or Venmo-like app that has you deal with multiple assets. 
Like that's actually a, a really shitty experience from that, from that point of view. And when we realized that Bitcoin was going to have its specific use case and not a bunch of others that people both demanded and I feel like the industry needed, that's when we had to make that hard decision. Okay, we're gonna to have to support multiple assets, right? Bitcoin has kind of ossified itself into its definition of, of sound money. And that's entirely fine. It's okay to specialize and to, you know, to be the thing that you, you feel like you're, you're good at. You know, they always say that at startups, right? Pick your expertise, specialize in it and excel at that one thing. That does come at the compromise of being flexible and being able to use for other things. So when we realized that that was happening and that Bitcoin wasn't gonna change, it wasn't gonna adopt other ideas, then that's when we branched out. And we said, okay, we do have to support um, other different assets. As well, our focus early on as Airbus, which is the original company name and original product was for payments. You know, we've, we had bit refill integration way back then like in, in the early days, I think the only company that integrated bit refill into an actual like self custody wallet. Um, and payments was a key part of our, our mission statement. We wanted to see Bitcoin be used in the economy. But as I mentioned, volatility, we kind of underestimated how powerful volatility was in making Bitcoin tough for payments. And that's when we said, okay, let's, let's pivot and focus on trade capabilities, buy, sell, and trade. But with the goal of getting people off the centralized exchanges, because that's where they all were. Now, even people that didn't need the, the, the speed of a centralized exchange and the trading options of a centralized exchange and whatnot, nothing fancy. They said, hey, I just want to acquire some Bitcoin, hold on to it for either a few months or a few years, maybe trade it into an, another asset that a friend of mine told me, but they weren't day traders or even weekly traders. Um, a lot of those people would make a purchase every couple of months, but then just leave it on the exchange. So our goal is let's get those type of people off the centralized exchanges into the self-custody apps like Edge, but allow them to do the functionality they needed, which is buy, sell, and trade a little less frequently, um, but with all the functionality that you know, they, they would require. So that's, that was kind of our vision. That's why we, we, we had pivoted to offer uh, more assets and we're excited to see what those assets bring, specifically things like privacy. Like you just cannot get the automatic level of privacy that a Monero offers in anything that's pure Bitcoin. There's always gonna be, I can do this, 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 and this to get a third the privacy of Monero. That's a good point you take. Like uh, obviously if your vision is that you want to provide the app that kind of provides users with the ability to transact in what they want and get involved in what they want, then I suppose to be able to accept these different cryptocurrencies is what achieves that yeah. goal essentially. Yeah. And the use is different now. It's not payments anymore, but the ideology is the same, right? So you want to give them the same level of very easy security, right? Key management is very different in edge than in other apps. You don't have to write down 24 words. Um, create an account and log in. So that part security being easy is still part of the mission statement. Um, privacy is still there. Everything in the app is fully encrypted. We don't see any of the transactions that people make when they send and receive money to and from friends. It's on the blockchain, but it doesn't go through us. So we don't know what our users are doing. Um, uh, security, privacy, and then the, the autonomy, which we didn't really touch on, which is that you're independent, you have control. Um, you know, there's other self custody apps where you control your private keys but you can't do anything unless the company's infrastructure is up. Like I cannot send a transaction on many different wallet options unless the company's servers are up for me to send a transaction through, to create the transaction for me and broadcast the transaction, know what my balance is. And that's fundamentally different. We, do, we, take, it, we take a much, much more difficult approach for just about all the functionalities in the app. So if Edge goes down, you can still send and receive money. Um, and so that privacy, security, autonomy, we'll, you'll see that in a lot of our marketing. Those are kind of three, three pillars of what we try to build. Um, it simply changed from privacy, security, and autonomy in a payments-focused app to privacy, security, and autonomy in a, in a buy, sell, and trade-focused, exchange-focused application. Yeah, you pointed it's out that one. Bitcoin on-chain was bad for payments. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you have an opinion on the Lightning Network? Do you see it as a possible solution or not? So I think, I, I think it is a possible solution. Um, however, much like what I'd mentioned before, I think it does have UX issues, like significant UX issues. Um, I try to stay pretty um, abreast of kind of new development in, in Lightning. I am probably about a year behind on new development. Um, so actually your team is one that I'd really love to be able to kind of sit down and chat with and understand some of the new development that may address some of the user experience issues. But based on my last trip in Miami, um, uh, while I think things have improved a bit, some of the main challenges that I see in driving adoption to a, you know, kind of the normie where they don't have to know that they're using, um, you know, this weird privacy preserving autonomous uh, technology. 
uh, I, I don't think is there yet. Right? It, it's hard to hide the complexity of lightning. You end up having to deal with its complexity. Um, and that's the part that, well, yeah, I can work. It, it still doesn't feel like it's gonna work for masses. And I'm hoping those problems get resolved, but in the interim, it's, uh, it still feels like it's, I won't call it necessarily early tech, but uh, unsolved problems still exist. But I, yeah, I would definitely like that to be resolved. You know, that, would, that would help you know, obviously Bitcoin heavily as it tries to compete with a lot of currencies that are claimed to be faster and cheaper. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I feel like the user experience is not quite there yet. So Paul, um, I listened to you and I, yeah, and I got this kind of vibe that it seems like you kind of like have a lot of expectations for, you know, Bitcoin and what they could achieve. And it seems that, you know, you feel that, you know, Bitcoin, you know, in your opinion, you might have fallen short of what you expected. So is, mm -hmm. is that actually the case? And do you see um, what exactly, if that is the case, what exactly were expectations of Bitcoin? And do you think that Bitcoin is currently being underutilized? My expectations is, you know, just ba based on the, the original founding of our company, what our, our mission was and what our product was trying to achieve was, yeah, it was, it was going to fully replace fiat currency, be used for payments, for store of value. It would basically digital gold before the dollar existed. And if we look back, you know, multiple hundreds of years ago, uh, we had gold, we had no internet, we didn't have any types of digital forms of payments, we had physical payments, and we had a hard money to do those payments with. So we had a hard money with gold, it was used for payments. And really what I saw is, that we transitioned from the hard money that we use for payments to a technology that layered, in a way it was a layer two technology, right? In the dollar, a debt-based instrument that had gold underneath it, backing it, but it was a more efficient technology. So checks are way more efficient to write in a million dollars worth, right? I can write a million dollar check with one little piece of paper. Um, a single piece of paper can represent a hundred dollars. That's really, you know, and you could stack a hundred dollars this big for $10,000. It's hard to do that with gold. So to me, the dollar was basically a payment mechanism for gold, but it got compromised because there was a, tr there was a trust factor in there. And the excitement about Bitcoin was, a, was my belief that it would allow us to return to the original underlying asset, but as I'd mentioned, with its own built-in payment network, which allowed a digital payment. So that was my hope. I, I expected, yeah, we'd replace the dollar. Everyone would be paying with Bitcoin. They would hold their, their value in Bitcoin just like they, they could have been gold. And yeah, you're right. It hasn't, it, in my eyes, it hasn't achieved that goal today. It might do so from the viewpoint of lightning getting adopted um, or other layer two solutions that can do the payment side of it uh, with, you know, just, you know, Bitcoin itself being the store of value side of it. But it, that to me hasn't come to fruition. And so that's where other assets are really trying to fill in that void. Whether they'll be successful, hard to say. It's really hard to say because there's so many and it's such a long tail. It's like Bitcoin here and then a long tail after that as far as other assets that are trying to be payment. Now, where I am excited and I think the industry does need to, uh, the industry is, is craving this need is for the decentralized applications. Unfortunately, those are coming to Bitcoin uh, with RSK um, and other similar pro kind of layer two protocols. Because if you think about Bitcoin by itself, it's basically the money and payments. If you take the analogy in our current financial system, there are companies and banks and services and whatnot that allow you to hold money and send and receive it. All right, so Venmo, send and receive. Credit card, send and receive. Uh, bank account, store it. But that's a fraction of our financial system. Then there's all the layers on top of it, such as hedging, trading, um, insurance, uh, all of those financial services. Ironically, I saw back in 2013 and 2014, built on Bitcoin, all centralized, all, I want to call, I hate to use that word centralized, but all with a company holding your funds or being an intermediary. If you wanted to take out a loan or, or issue funds for a loan, there was a company right in the middle of it. It's almost like all of these projects couldn't figure a way of doing it in a trustless, uh, censorship resistant, globally accessible manner, because that's all Bitcoin really had. It was just payments. And so the introduction of DeFi allows us to cut out more of the, the payment, the, the financial stack from the legacy institutions. Whereas if all you have was payments, then all those legacy institutions are going to do the exact same thing they were already doing and put their more centralized alternatives right on top of your decentralized money. And then if you do that, you're, you're then taking the money and putting it in a centralized service because you need that service. You need a loan. You need X, Y, Z. 
you need insurance. Well, then it's just going to go right back to where we were before. So I'm excited about the, the kind of the DeFi ecosystem because it's taking a bigger chunk out of that, you know, existing uh, large monopoly of, of financial services. Um, and that Bitcoin base layer stuff really didn't solve. And so I, I thank Ethereum for introducing that. And even the tools that are on top of Bitcoin are using Ethereum technology. So RSK, 100% like Ethereum technology, not 100, 99%, but now sitting on top of Bitcoin. So into, um, I guess, uh, pull away from Bitcoin and more towards uh, Edge Wallet in general, um, that I wanted to ask was, um, I guess, whether there's anything uh, that you have in the, that you're working on now or in the immediate future that you're kind of proud of or want to talk about really, essentially, that's going on with Edge. Like, is there anything you're up to that you're kind of, yeah, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying you should, you know, <laughs> give away all the secrets or anything, but uh, is there anything yeah. you kind of wanted to, wanted to mention at all to the listeners out there that's, that's going on that you're super interested in or, you're happy about got it uh, we're a pretty transparent company we kind of give people you know quote unquote roadmap because the roadmap is very who knows what's going to happen crypto is too volatile to actually really predict hey we're going to do this in a year <laughs> right our roadmap is like two weeks long but here are the things that we're interested in and we want to incorporate definitely DeFi for sure like i've used DeFi on the ethereum chain for my own personal need and when i say personal need it's not to play the DeFi casino the way people like um uh bless his heart uh, peter mccormick will say he thinks a DeFi is a gigantic casino, but no, I actually wanted to take out a loan. I didn't want to spend my Bitcoin. I don't want to sell it. I want to take a loan collateralized in Bitcoin. And I had the choice of going to these behemoth companies that will hold my money. And actually, you know, I give up control to these, to these companies or I can use DeFi and I chose to use DeFi. Um, I love that I didn't have to give any personal information. My credit score is not affected at all. No one knows that I'm doing this other than whoever I tell. Um, and so, uh, that though required multiple steps with multiple apps, right? In order for me to go and actually take out this loan. Um, we want to make that integrated entirely in edge, just a few taps, take out a loan, send dollars right into your bank account, just like that. So that's one of our goals. Definitely. We want to streamline DeFi where it's not like this other app and you've got your wallet here, you got your swap, you got to swap into the right tokens here. Um, your, your key manager wallet app here. And then the DeFi website here, it's a, giant mess. Um, to me, it's a great proof of concept to know that this stuff works and there's enough liquidity, but now we got to actually vertically integrate that. Right. And that's, that's what I'm excited about from the viewpoint of, we want to get that in not actively being worked on right now, but we're trying to design the different screens. What we think is the good middle ground between the full fledged interface you might see on a full desktop app versus the, the kind of the, uh, minimized, uh, minimum viable product that you would see in a, in a small mobile app. So DeFi for sure, as well, you know, some improvements into the offerings in Bitcoin. Um, so we currently don't currently have, for example, Betch32 address support. You can spend to a Betch32 address, but you can't receive into one. So that's current actively in development. It's working. It's in internal testing um, as well because of the fees that are in Bitcoin. You know, it's it, some features that I really, really, really dislike in all honesty. To me, these are poor. The fact that we need these are very poor user experience, but you know, we just have to deal with it, which are features like RBF and CPFP. So for your audiences that might not be familiar with those features, they're a way to take a transaction that either you've received or you may have sent um, with a specific fee. And when you realize later that, that fee isn't sufficient, maybe the network fees have spiked up, it allows you to broadcast an accelerated version of that transaction. RBF, you're broadcasting almost the same transaction, but with higher fee. CPFP is a way of broadcasting another transaction that will accelerate your original one. So to me, like I'd mentioned, that's the fact that we need it is just terrible user experience. Like whenever have you ever had to do that in, in making a payment? It's like, mm, I didn't put enough of a fee. Let me do it again. If that wasn't enough. Let me do it again. It, that doesn't exist. It's a terrible experience, but admittedly it's better than my transaction stuck. Well, I'm not sure what to do now. So it's, it's the middle ground from really, really, really bad to what I really want. And so hence, you know, it's going to be a feature that is just, it's kind of a necessity in, in actually both uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so we're going to be having that. It'll be super simple. One tap, accelerate the transaction and you're good to go. I think that's actually a really good, good idea though, to have that in that simple fashion. I mean, it's something that, um, you know, working some support for BitRefill and, and our companies is like seeing the amount of people who don't understand, like, okay, well, I've sent you my Bitcoin, you know, 
what, where's my product or whatever and it's like well you, you may have done that but it's not getting here anytime soon with that fee yeah <laughs> uh, you basically sent on the slow boat from china yeah uh, so like how do we then amp that boat and like put put some jet thrusters on it yeah you gotta Pretty push much. this button and that's the yeah, thing exactly. if, if you can provide a user, user um a situation where it's like hey you know not arrived yet whatever just boom press a button and it's done like that's that's pretty powerful to be able to do that because as you say it's not the easiest for people to understand at the beginning and for myself it's something that you know makes total sense uh, but like for someone who's getting involved or me you know two three years ago whatever it was it was a whole minefield of confusion so, yeah yeah we were so, of the it's... mindset when we first launched that we didn't even want to show people uh, an option to change fees. Like our goal is like, hey, we should choose the right one from the start. Um, having to change a fee in general is still a, already a bad enough user experience. Um, but as blocks got full, that just became mandatory. Right? People had to be able, given the option to say, I care how fast it goes in or I don't care how fast it goes in. Um, but to this day, it's a, it's a horrible unsolved problem. You know, it's people choose a fast fee. It, we, we default them to a high fee. People complain when it's expensive. We default them to a slower one. People complain because it doesn't confirm. There's just, you can't make everyone happy. And that's probably the number one source of support calls mm. is easily the fee on, on chains where the blocks are full, which is Bitcoin and Ethereum. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, that, that makes a lot of sense as well. I can expect that. To, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, I, um, I think it's probably a good time to, to wrap up as we're coming on to an hour anyway. Um, but I could have, could have gone on for many more hours. I can tell you that. Um, as I say, it's been, I've really appreciated uh, your time and it's been awesome to like chat to you and get some insight to, to what, you know, you guys are up to in edge and, um, kind of hearing your story as well. I, I say, I really, I really do appreciate you coming on. It's been, been fantastic. Um, and well, thanks well, for having me. Super appreciate being here. Thank you very much. And I say thanks also to anyone who's listened in as well. Um, uh, we, we appreciate you guys. Uh, it allows us to continue talking to people like Paul who are interesting and have a cool story to tell and can give us a lot of interesting information uh, about the world in crypto. So um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, say, take care, everyone out there listening. Uh, have an awesome week or day and uh, buy some Bitcoin. See you later. Yep.